Well, a good deal. This is my good friend, Michael Hubert. I'm Dan Glomsky. I'm one of the two mad scientists here at the center. Mike's a good friend of mine. He's done classes for us here. <laughs> yeah, they're real familiar. <laughs> two introverts. Yeah, All right. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And hopefully Sarah Bailey, who's our other presenter, shows up from Prairie Plains Resource Institute. Maybe she got detained somewhere. But hopefully she'll show up before too long. I wanted Sarah on the program to give you a break in the middle hour for my open face. So. Uh, I'd like to start class with what you would like to bring out of this. So here's a little survey, and you can answer yes to any of these that apply. Why are you here today? Yes. First, first question is, <laughs> I want to improve the pollination of my garden or orchard. Yes. Arm up. I got to see. I, give me a hand. Show hands. All right. About half. I want honey for my table. Okay. And I want pure, known origin. Honey. All right. You know about the locavore movement? Have you heard of that? It's, it's sort of a, a quest to eat food that's grown within 50 miles of home. So that's kind of new to you. Okay, good. And I want a healthier natural sweetener. High fructose corn sugar or GMO beet sugar. Allergy relief, anybody looking for that? Okay. And there's a whole class called apitherapy that uses kind of controlled stings. Beekeepers have the lowest incidence of arthritis of the population. Some of that is, I think, related to the immunomodulation of, of the bee's venom, the bee stings. So there is a whole science of that. Charlie Mraz has written a couple books. Charlie's I believe still alive, but uh, I'm almost as crazy as he is the other way around. Charlie is kidded as he is tens of bees in just a pair of shorts. I have done that. So. Any of you acquired bee equipment either from ancestors or bought a place that was had a barn full of it? Not as not as common as I thought. And then Dan brought up. Concerns for bees or pollinators in general? Good, good, good. There's a master naturalist program, I think this is the point. Anybody need a new hobby? Besides the ex mayor? <laughs> okay. Say, growing, getting stung by somebody other than fellow human bees. Okay. Yeah, I want my own bees stinging me, not strange bees. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, Scouts and 4-H, I believe, have a program still that you can earn a badge. It used to be you had to have a high. Now you kind of can study some of the pollinator problems. Is that right? But uh, why don't we give you a good and better than a badge and get you a high? Would be good? Yeah. Anybody look for supplemental income? <laughs> but it's, it's not your prime driver's day. Okay. And then if you go up further, it'd be primary income. Is there some Renaissance people in here, polymaths, or just got a broad interest in natural curiosity? Yeah. I heard you out there. Would you like to become an advocate for the bees? I'm here conscripting soldiers. I really am, because we've got a problem out there. Beyond an advocate, I could take you on to activism, if you're interested. But, all right, now this is just to choose one or the other. All right, let's go. Equipment first, the bare essentials, which you need to do, and you need to do soon, is if you want to bees this year, and you want to get package bees, you need to get your order in, okay? Your closest source is probably Lincoln, Valhalla Bees, uh, past frequent president of Nebraska Beekeepers has Valhalla Bees. He bought it from Charlie Simons, who used to be just east of Lincoln. Now it's he's got an office or in a sales room inside of Lincoln, like 27th somewhere. But they love Val Valhalla Bees. 48. 48th? 48th, okay. So Brian's got some things there. We got 
Brian's got as much or more experience than I do, so he's going to keep me honest today. You've <laughs> got that insurance. It looks like this, a little bit cleaner. But uh, in this package will be three pounds of bees, three or four, and that's about 10,000 bees. This little can, they can uh, sugar solution, 50% sugar water. There's just three tiny little holes in there. They punch those after they get the bees in there and invert this and it is stopped. I'm going to stop there. And in transit, this is their food when they come usually from California, some come from Texas. And this is the queen cage. They her all her needs while she's in transit. That is suspended in this little slot here. And this queen didn't grow up with all those bees that she shipped with. They just funnel in those pounds of bees and her, and in the transit time, they will be tending her. They will be spreading around her queen mandibular hormone that says, hey, we're all calm. So they get acclimated to each other in transit. But you still are a little bit cautious when you bring them home. And I'm going to buzz through things today that's kind of bare necessities. My friend Larry, whose camera that is, he couldn't be here today, came down and filmed a lesson to get started. And we've got one on YouTube called Beekeeping 101. It'll review this completely. Larry's site is Video Pole. Pole stands for his Polish heritage. Is it Larry Maltese? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And it's one word. If you put a space in there, you'll get pulled in a sandwich. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's not bad. I don't know what you're looking at. But I recommend either you have a friend that has a hive with you, start at the same time, or get two hives. There's some versatility to that. For example, if you lose a queen, you can go over that other hive if it's thriving, pull five frames that have new eggs on them, set, bring them to that hive that is queenless, and they will pick out probably three or four or five, maybe up to seven of those young larvae that we hatch and groom that as a queen. And the difference between a queen and a worker is <coughs> two extra days of royal jelly. But they will pick her out, feed her accordingly, they'll elongate that cell instead of being just one cell on the surface there. They will elongate that down to look like a, a Spanish peanut shell about that size. It gives her more room to grow bigger. But you bring these home. You tap them down to the bottom. Take this can out. Pull out the queen. Put it back. foundation on it. That's, that's an option coming at you. Again, we're starting with the basics. You just wire that thing between a couple of frames there. Tap them out into there. Pull a couple of frames so there'll be some space for them to fill into, maybe on, on either side. Shake as many out as you can. With, don't shake out. You can just lay in the front there. And those bees from the inside will start seeing, hey, we've got a decent place here. They'll give off a, a Maisonov scent that sort of smells like lemon oil pledge. And these bees in here, plus that queen stand in there is also a big lure for them. They will come marching out of there for a rest, walking right into the hive. It's, it's a miracle. The drapers is where I got my first two, down in Auburn. Pass that around for the address if you want. They said, well, there's kind of a labor-free way, and, and drapers do some nomadic pollination services, so that they're a little bit different than us backyard beekeepers. I, I kind of labeled this a backyard beekeeping thing. But you can gear up and get bigger. I think everybody have a, ought to have a hive in the backyard. Now, when this thing's empty, and try to do this, 
late in the day, okay? Because they'll go in and kind of set up house and not go and do some flights that they could get disoriented on. It's good for them to, to settle in in the evening and then have this, this sunrise of a new day to start out. This opening, that may be only three eighths by three eighths. This, this is my own design that I've developed and liked. I did it to uh, be able to lock this, this end of entrance reducer into here. Because critters like honey too. <laughs> most, most of the designs will just let this be sort of weighted down by the hive. But raccoons have clever little hands, okay? <laughs> Skunks have a, a pushing little nose and they'll push in there and they will, they're not going for the honey, they're eating the bees, they like the insects. And in the spring, do not be surprised, I didn't believe this at first, but a lady who had one of our the scholarships with the Nebraska Beekeepers Association, that I've got cardinals eating my bees. But that's true. When bees, normally vegetarian birds, uh, get enough from the environment, but in the spring, this is a good source of protein when they're laying eggs or they're raising fledglings, and they will eat some beans. But it's, it's temporary. And I've, I've had two cubby of quail come into my acreage, and they'll snag a few bees, too. <laughs> Again, on the startup, I, I choked this down to one three-eighths inch wide by three inches wide. If I've got, I've got a good shot, so I've got these sticks with every size of opening. This is about as big an opening as you need for the summer. If our bottom boards used to be solid, now we make a screen bottom. And this is just a good integrated pest management stock or method to cut down on the varroa mites, which Bayer wants us to believe is the cause of colony collapse disorder. If you believe that, I've got some small plant in Florida and stuff. So. Right. But this, this screen bottom, the bees will jostle each other and dislodge those varroa mites, but bees also are very hygienic and they will ask another bee to groom them. So if your bees are in good health and you've got high varroa sensitive variety, they'll flick those little varroa mites through, they'll fall down through the bottom and when they fall through here, they're a really good protein source for a couple species of ants. And they'll recycle and get rid of them for you. So this is just a good method. It's chemical free. I, I'd recommend it over the, the bottom boards. And in the winter time, you can either drop, I, I recommend that people have their hives up off the ground. You can do that with cinder blocks. You can do it with used shipping pallets. You can make a frame of two by sixes, two long ones here, and a cross one, and set your bees up on that. And going up higher, that sure doesn't hurt either because it, it's the amount of the bees and the, the skunks and things. Bottom here is a drill out. And there will be a cork plug in that. Take out that cork plug and put in half a miniature marshmallow. Okay, you put it in there, and again, they'll spread the, the, their new colony scent to that box, and you, if the bees are masked on here trying to attack that queen, they've accepted her already, so you're probably in good shape. But you hang it in there, they will eat that marshmallow out in about a day or so, liberate that queen and she'll go around it without do her business, okay? <coughs> uh, some people don't want to go back and check if she's been let loose or they've got lots of hives and they'll just pull that and, and set it in there and go. I think it's a good idea, especially if you're starting backyard, let the bees eat her out of there. 
marshmallows. People used to do hard candy, but that's a little takes a little too long for them to chew out of the marshmallows. Better. Mike, you got a burden. No. Okay. Yeah, one bottom box is what you need to receive the beans, and it'll take them a while to fill that up. But then have a second bottom box, and when eight frames are full, you need to add that in there so they can expand into it. And your goal at first year is to fill two of these boxes with brood and honey. And they'll, they'll quit making brood laying eggs and making brood in October or so. And then as those hatch out, they'll fill those, those <coughs> back in with food for the winter. Honey and bee bread. Bee bread is a combination. It's sort of a delayed protein source for them to use in the spring when they gear up and start laying eggs in, in February. As the days start to get noticeably longer. Valentine's Day is Valentine's Day more because of Mother Nature than anything. That's when bees start gearing up. It's when your cardinals and birds, other birds start singing their love songs for the spring, setting up their territory and things. The day length gets to sufficient length to get that going. With that warm batch we have, the bees are going to be gearing up maybe a little soon, but this weekend might seem a little bit. Now sizes. This is properly called a hive body, but there always gets to be more terms thrown into the mix. It's a brood box. Some mistakenly name it a deep super. Well, that's kind of like a giant midget. It's a wrong, it's a wrong terminology. I, I, re I reserve the term super for the, the honey supers that you put on top. These are smaller. Here's some old comb on there. And here's another option that you gotta decide. When, when you buy these, you'll also order frames. You can buy all this stuff already assembled, or you can get the pieces and assemble it yourself. Considerable savings to that. And then you can decide if you wanna buy a foundation. And foundation is just, here's something I wish I ever gone down to doing. And this is the ultra thin. You could put that smaller size in this size if you don't want to sell extracted honey. Some people really love comb honey. And that ultra thin is old. it's a lighter wax and it's it's food grade for humans. And they will draw that out and then you can slice it and there's some boxes that it fits in sell someone a whole comb if you want to. But comb honey got popular in the 1920s and roaring 20s and everybody was chasing the buck like they are now. And of course that gives the temptation to uh, maybe dilute some honey with some, uh, water and, and sugar or now people use high fructose corn syrup. So that bargain honey that you see for less than four dollars a pound may not have much honey at all. There's some rules and regulations that kicked in. But this happened again way back 100 years ago. So people knew if they were buying home honey, they knew they were getting honey because nobody can can counterfeit home honey, at least not economically. It just, just isn't possible. So you could buy a foundation that'll fit the whole frame. Uh, I'm a little scared because where does foundation honey come, wax come from? From wax that beekeepers sell back to the dealers. Now, even Valhalla will buy your excess cappings or, or beeswax, and you'll, you can trade it for a foundation that is all formed and rolled out and ready to go. Uh, I'm cheap. I'm, I'm half Mennonite and half Scandinavian, so we're a pretty frugal bunch. And Ross Conrad kind of taught me this. I just cut one inch strips of this foundation and I make my own frames. Uh, let me show you a prototype here. I leave this little ridge of wood. 
the center. So it's about an eighth inch by an eighth inch. And I can just melt on our beeswax. Well, did you see that I brought the double water, didn't I? Got the movement and heat it down. And I just use. Should I apologize here? I just call this a bulb source syringe. Got that hot wax. Just suck up a little bit and then I just run a, just run a line along here. And they'll probably, I've had them start their own just from that little line of wax. So now with that melted wax, I can put that strip against there, run a little bead along there, weld it in. And that starter strip, makes it more uniform. If you make them start it off of this, with just that line in there, what they'll do is they'll get a batch of bees starts here in the middle, a batch of bees starts here, and a batch of bees starts here. And these three little triangles come down and then they get welded here and there'll be some irregular spots. But those irregular spots still fill with a, a bigger cell for the drone. Now this, this hive of 10,000 that you brought in, when the honey flow is gonna quickly jump to 60,000. That queen is laying average 1,500 eggs per day. But there's 25 cells per square inch or 25 and a half on two sides. So that amounts to 55 squells or cells per square inch. It's about 6,500 cells on one of these deeper frames. So it takes her four days to fill just one frame. And they're working like crazy. And when, as you have, if you're putting putting them into the foundation or the new frames, uh, they've got to be building comb. And that comb requires about uh, six to seven pounds of honey to make one pound of, of beeswax. But the good thing is, one pound of beeswax, these, these cell walls are 25,000 thick. It's down to a thin is 25, 10,000 thick. So that pound of honey makes 33,000 or, or fills a half a box, a one pound of wax, excuse me. So they're pretty frugal too. Okay, you need two boxes, you need 20 frames. Or two frames. Sure. Even yeah. this one's modified, but it's going to have a... We're up on top, Brian. It'll, it'll be straight here, and uh, it'll be one and three eighths inch thick. Well, if you're a carpenter, or got a little bit of that in your jeans, you know nailing into end grain is not hold very well. No matter how long a nail you put in there. I have gone to reinforcing it. And when you pry one of these up out from the bottom of the hive, there's going to be wax, bridge comb, and wax, and propolis, and it kind of resisting me pulling that out. So I have gone to making this a dovetail. And I don't nail from the top and the bottom anymore. I drill and go to the grocery store and get you a pack of bamboo key bob sticks. It's way cheaper than wood towels. Just as strong. And I'll drill through, glue that in, and saw it off and go on. Because bees do not like metal. They do not like plastic. I noticed in the standard nail ones, they would cover those nail heads. They didn't want that cold metal exposed to the hive. So avoid plastic and metal at all costs. And my bees are, are just, I do everything I can to keep them calm. And they appreciate this, I promise you. Foundation in there. They can vary a little bit in the, the size of the comb. I've got one here for you. That is capped. Okay. And it's 
got that kind of smooth seam to it versus if it is brewed, each one will be kind of a little raised thing where the, the embryo is, is in. And the drones will be even bigger. It'll be, be like a bullet head on the ship. So. Thanks. And I was practicing and I had a lot of irons in the fire. And I depended on <laughs> uh, Mr. Hegemeyer to be around and be my mentor. He lost his wife to cancer. He got a pen pal and before I knew it, he's in Tennessee. <laughs> so I didn't have my, my mentor. I don't like this component of the commercial hives. It's, it's a, a handy hand hold. But this wood is already only three quarter inches thick. You, you dig out half of that and you've got four cold spots in your hive. So that is why I have gone to those. Those are just foot locker poles. So would it be better to put a wooden table on there and start foot locker poles with cold yeah, steel? Yeah, probably would. Probably would. I, I like these that they fold down, plop down out of the way, and they're somewhat removed from the high. I don't let the screws penetrate into the interior. Two boxes, 20 frames. And build them how you like, but I, I brought some things for you to avoid some of the mistakes that I ran into. We've discovered B-Space, and pretty much this hive design that we have now is triple L. Lorenzo Lorraine Langstroth. And you'll hear this called the Langstroth High. He was a minister and an educator and, and probably an example of borderline between genius and insanity. He gets very thin. So he had some, some mental problems, but he was brilliant in his work here and recording. And that magic distance is 5 sixteenths of an inch plus or minus a sixteenth. So a quarter to three eighths is okay. If the space is less than that, they will glue it together with propolis. If it is more than that, they will fill it with what's called bridge comb. And both of them you know, waste the bees enterprises by having to, when you pull your frames out, you break it up again. But that's that's what they aim for. And here's another little trick. Those standard edges here are an inch and three eighths thick. The magic width, interior width of a pipe body is 14 and five eighths. Well then, the equipment computers will sell you, lately even sold Hegemeyer. Little metal protectors that supposedly preserve the edge of that rabbit for longer. And then they'll sell you little divider things that automatically space those. Well, again, my, my frugal nature says just make them one tenth of that distance or 1.46 inches wide. And then they're all in there snug, and I get less incidents of bees gluing these together at those contact spots because there is a gap there. If they're touching, they don't, and I can lift these frames out much easier without, with less destruction or less disruption. And I don't know how many of you have a, a wood shop that you want to do this, so we can talk about that with those of you interested in doing that. But what I basically do is, is get a dimension two by 10, I, I save scraps on them, anything. And I will either set up a, a saw blade or a dado head, or if you've got a, a router table, you can uh, go across the uh, bottom of that block to make the gap up here. And it's a smaller gap down there. You've got the, that block root. And then I will run in with run that groove, run this groove, and then I'll set up 
my fence and the table saw slide along here and narrow this down. You, you narrow this down for that B space again, for them to go around the end and next to the next side or next to the frame. And I put a, a rough kind of a coarse sanding drum in a drill press to set up a guide and smooth that. And you want two thirds of that frame with added B travel space and then leave one third that just keeps the frames apart. Okay. Get started with that as I launch. I need to make a quick interruption here. Do buy a brush. Uh, this is a, this is not a, a, an animal fiber thing. This is all synthetic and it's one place you can do it. But it's, it's very gentle. It moves them out of the way. Because the thing you don't want to do is smash bees. Let me give you. I'll show you a mistake that I did in my first one. They said, all you have to do is pull out five of those frames and just set that in there and close it up and walk away and it'll be okay. I did one that way and one more I dumped it in. And this is the very box that did it. I went back and checked that that queen was out in seven days. They were building comb in here. And all that comb that they built was wasted because I had to take it out of there and put the frames back in. So I don't recommend that method to anybody. Go ahead and get them in. Uh, mistakes I made. Yeah, maybe. Somebody might lend you one. Uh, on top of it, you put this on. These pith helmets are nice. I looked without one. Lola got me one so we could do this program today. Uh, and Lola, did you do have any luck with that cartoon? I didn't. There was a cartoon in the uh, New Yorker that a friend sent me to kind of just give me a little bit about the beekeeping. Two guys all dressed up and and one says to the other one, one one's got bees inside here. And the other one's, John, the bees go outside the veil. <laughs> but have these these things in front because people will mess this up too. This goes around, comes around here. Yeah. There you go. And I am dressed this way today to kind of be an example. I meant this for the later thing, later session, but we can just well do it now. Bees don't like dark colors, or if you don't want to get stung, and that's, that's the big question. Dress in light colors, uh, white or, or tan, Oxford light blue is probably okay. Bees don't see in red, their whole vision thing has shifted to the blue range. They see UV that we don't see. They see red as black, they see black as bare, they see bare as bad. So, uh, don't wear black, don't wear red, you tend to be, okay? Uh, this is way more than I need to armor up. I, I wore this stuff today, not for the fashion statement, but to have something elasticized tight at your wrists. If this isn't tight enough to keep a bead out, put a wrap of, of uh, duct tape around it. Uh, wear white socks. Tuck your pants in there. They're not going to invite us under the red carpet at the Grammy Awards, but we don't care. That's pretty beat tight, but uh, you can do duct tape there. I, I wore it again, uh, seamless garment, so to speak, here. But they will crawl in the edge of a shirt, a button shirt. and. They're okay until they feel trapped, and then they're going to stain. They feel trapped. So just take away the opportunity. Uh, plant materials, wear cotton, wear linen. Do not wear hair. Do not wear leather, uh, wool, etc. That's animal, and that's foreign, and that's unwelcome or unpopular. Okay? I don't want. 
I want a stain every once in a while for my endotherapy, and, and it doesn't bother me. But uh, be careful with, you know, I was afraid when I started back up in, in 2009, I took a sting, and it's, well, it, and they're kind of a hot shot. You know, I like old life, and it doesn't, it doesn't sting, it stings, that's why they call it a sting. <laughs> a couple days later, I took another sting, and that one got kind of red. And then I took another sting, and that lit up all of them, and it swelled up to the elbow, and I went, oh no, am I gonna be hypersensitive? That was just the immune system saying, okay, we've got this label, it's done, life threatening, it's all right. But then there are people that go on to anaphylaxis. And I don't want to minimize that, but uh, I was just reading a, a bit again in the hive and the honeybee. They said it's it's really trumped up, the medical profession doesn't know how to handle it. They said more people die in a car accident on the way for emergency treatment then would be killed by an anaphylactic reaction. So, uh, conduct yourself accordingly, I guess. If you're worried about it, know somebody you know, that's an EMT or in the medical world and get you an EpiPen. And that, hi Sarah. Hello. Here's the pretty part of it. Called a queen excluder. Those gaps are such that a worker bee can get through there, but the queen can't. You could put that on top of your two brood boxes, and by doing that, <coughs> there will be no brood laid in this, this comb that's up here. It will only be filled, can only be filled with honey. Okay? Some people, including me, call that a honey excluder too. It cuts down the amount of honey. Is that because it's metal? It, I think that's part of it, Jan. I think that it's so. Uh, it's inconvenient for even that worker to squeeze between there. And they will, as you can see, they'll throw up some, some bridge comb and block the ways up through there. And I have found. <coughs> When you get into bees, you'll get invited to, to go and rescue a hive from a, a branch that's blown off a tree. And to give you an idea how big a tree was, this isn't the central trunk, it's a branch. It's a huge one. And it was, that's a lot of capacity in there, and that's just one chunk of it. That thing broke down and that whole block of Hastings just thought it was in a storm. <laughs> there would be circling it. We brought in boxes and put comb in there. And another thing, we talked about that those bees giving the scent, of saying this is home. They've got their little, they're facing the entrance. They've got their little butts in the air. They're waving their wings and that scent is coming off of the nasonoff gland. It's at the tip of their abdomen. saying, Ollie, Ollie, oxen free. Heck, this is home. Well, you can mix up sugar water, 50-50. Put in a couple drops of lemongrass oil, which you can get from Jan and Carlson. Yes, Lola, yes. That does massage on the square there. And a couple drops of that really imitates that scent and it'll draw them on. And that the same sprayer can maybe substitute for this. This is a smoker. Tear some newspaper strips or what, put a sheet of newspaper right in there, and then go to either pine needles or I like walnut hulls. I have walnut trees, and there is a tranquilizing compound in anything walnut. Woodworkers will, will have a, a relaxed feeling coming out of the shop when they're making some kind of walnut. It's in a sudden jug home. So I use walnut shells in mine. You could use burlap. Try to be sure that it is chemical free. Just cut a strip of that. That's about the height of that, roll it up, and stuff that in, and it'll burn just kind of at a nice rate, and you close that up, and it'll smolder slowly. 
You don't want a raging fire in there. This little bellows forces air in this little tube at the bottom here and stokes that fire, keeps it going for you, and puffs the smoke into the hive. You just, and you want kind of a cool white smoke, not a hot smoke. You don't want flames roaring out the top. Let it climb down. Two or three puffs. And it's it's partly masquerade that masks the scent of somebody foreign being around. But over the years, they it was their adjustment to fire. If there's smoke, there might be fire, and this this pipe could be toast. They will go in, load up on honey, ready to go if the flames arrive. Now every time you do that, you're costing yourself some honey production. So you this this same sprayer that you made up a solution. If you can't hide your bees, you can bring them home with that package and put them in a cool space and spray that sugar water on that screen side and wait till better weather to hide them. But work on the bees, spray them with sugar water solution on their wings. They don't fly very well. They'll go home and say, hey, I got some sugar water. Let's take it to the carriers to put it in the hive and we'll turn it into the hive. So, uh, this is not necessary, but it, it's a nice safety net, let's put it that way. That if you, for some reason, enrage a sentinel and she kind of tells the rest of them that, hey, invader around here, uh, you can calm them down with this. I, I hardly use it. Finish off the equipment. There's your, your honey super. A lot of people thin this down to only eight or nine instead of ten. And there's some good logic in that. These combs will be wider. There'll be more honey in it. You'll get more honey per extraction. Uh, with doing less frames, it could be a time saver. And by having that thin down to eight or nine, then it won't line up with those combs below. It'll sort of be a queen stop on its own. And the queen likes long expanses of, uh, of, of comb. Dan Diffenbaugh and I were called to say that high. That square column. The bees set it up so that the comb ran at the diagonal. And those longest combs, and of course each one, as it went to the, to the opposite corners, got smaller. That queen had brood in the, the long ones. And the, the, as they got down to a certain size, there was only honey and bee bread in those. So there's something of queen exclusion just by being on long comb. That's where she wants to be. So that's another reason I don't use a queen excluder. Again, this inner cover. The commercial ones will have this gap on both sides, and that's an emergency escape or ventilation. It's also kind of a lighter piece to manipulate to put back on the hive. And here's a little tip for dipping into the afternoon stuff. But you can use your bee brush and move these bees away so you don't put the box on. But something about that brush makes them just insanely curious. They come up and say, what the hell was he moving us away from there for? What's going on here? So they come back. So in, instead of dropping this down and having this whole area be bees that could possibly be smashed, set it down like this, okay? So you've only got these four little spots to have bees off of four here, four here, and then just gently twist them into place, okay? That will move them away instead of smashing, because the thing that uh, stinging will inactivate the hive, the hive alarm and send more out to sting you, but smashing a bee releases that same hormone, so just be gentle with your bees, okay? If you don't smash them, you can keep working, get your work done. They may never know you were there. 
their sense of smell, again, not that's coming from the afternoon, is such, it's offensive to them to smell oleic acid, which is the smell of rotting flesh, especially out of their own bees. So that upsets the bees. And if you don't have smashed bees in there, you kind of grade yourself how well you did last time by when you go and check the bees the next time and see how many smashed bees are there. And you'll get to the point where you will have them. And then you have arrived. Okay? That's the inner cover. I, I, boy, you always forget something. They make a little thing that's in this shape called a bee escape. It fits right in here. It's plastic. So these don't lie. But, and there's four little metal fingers. There's a hole in the center. They can crawl down in that hole and then go between the metal fingers either way. But when they get through the little metal fingers, they're spring steel and they close. So it's called a bee escape or a bee excluder. Yeah. If you've got a, if you want to harvest a whole super of honey, you just move this down into there, and it's a one-way valve. Make sure you get it the right way. You don't have all the bees coming up into the super. Uh, there's arrows on it. You put that between there, and in 24, 36 hours, if you do it at the end of the day, a couple nights in the day, they will all be moved down into there. You grab your honey super and go extract honey. You can buy bee, expensive bee blowers and blow them off, and that's what the commercial guys do. They don't have time for all this manipulation. You just blow them off with air. Um, but again, I'm, I'm aiming this at a backyard place. And you don't need all that extraneous stuff. All right. This, those grooves match grooves in this commercial hive cover. There's two versions of this. For us backyard people, the guys that are migratory, and that's five-eighths of our bees. Five-eighths of our bees are traveling to California about now, in the whole country. One and a half million hives need to go to California to, to pollinate almonds. Brian went to California, he can tell you about that. It's a big deal. It's an $18 billion industry. In the hot of the summer, this screw should be on the top. The bees will use this for an exit somewhat, but it's also their ventilation thing. They cool their hive, keep it at 95 degrees, by bringing in water, evaporating it, and, that, and then there's bees that set up currents and they move the air up, which heat naturally rises. They move it to here and then to this little gap, which lines up with this little gap, and there they can blow it out that way. <coughs> if it's a really hot day, I will help them out. I will prop this up and either leave it right there, and that lets that rise pretty much naturally, or at least they can assist it, but they're not fighting anything. When it's down, they gotta push it down. But this is more efficient ventilation, and if it's really hot, I'll take an eighth inch metal rod. That's what the cattle panel, combination panels are, it's quarter inch rod. And I'll set that under here, and prop that up that much more, and that really helps them come. Now you can reduce some of that heat by having some shade available, or, or making some shade. Summer heat can be a problem. These like to warm. They maintain that high body in there at 95 degrees. Get a hive tool and get this type. When they, they'll sell you kits that have everything that they think you need. And that will be one that looks like a jiffy tool. This little J tool is much handier. You can go between those. Uh, those springs and that little J lets you go in there, lift that one up, break it loose. So insist on this high tool, okay? It's 
got the edge you need here to force in there and pry the boxes apart. Your, your combs are going to be, they're going to have wax, extra wax on them. It's a nice cleaner to pull that off. Pull it off of there if you're using those narrower ones. That's the tool. Again, this is the one they'll sell you. I have a lot of beekeepers say their, their bees are calmer with the game of the roof. I like the art and the romance of it. And I, I did not get around to building this until I had the incentive to talk to you folks this week. <laughs> and I finally got one of these made. And this, this box is a little wider. But that needs to slip down. And I, and I made the, the ones you buy have the gap at both ends. And that's a little bit too much extra entrance. I just do it at one. And then if you do that, you can close up your hives and transport them more easily by having those gaps of the inner cover and the gap of the other cover on the opposite way. Okay. I'm going to give you a break and I'm going to continue some of this and the other, but feed Sarah, host bees and pollinators in general. After Sarah, I'll talk to you more about the skills you need, the sting aversion, uh, the manipulation, and miscellaneous, whatever you got to handle. This is the beautiful Sarah, and talented Sarah. If I'd have been smart, I'd have had her playing a cello, which she is. Symphony great. Oh, that today. I haven't played in a while. <laughs> but, uh, Sarah's with Prairie Plains. If you're not familiar with Prairie Plains, it's a prairie restoration and uh, maintenance type organization. Land Trust, Educational Land Trust. Land Trust. <laughs> and don't be afraid to, if you've got some extra money that you need to throw at something or trying to buy the Sherman Ranch, uh, that's going to be a nature preserve and a a safe haven for bees and pollinators. There's a little bit of difference here. These Prairie Plains folks are into native things, and our European honeybee is not a native here. So uh, it doesn't. We still like them. They still, Sarah still likes them. You know, if we were birds, I'm not a native here too, and I shouldn't be here. <laughs> the bee as useful as it is. And I just realized this week. Sitting this way, it could be a food dehydrator. You can open this up and put a screen in there. And I think you could dehydrate quite a few things. But I build it as a wax melter for all the wax that I want to render and, and scrape out of the hive. And then in, in that mode, it sits like this. angle boards, oh, there's a big metal tray that's that size, and, and then on top of that yet is a quarter inch mesh hardware cloth with a spacer, half inch spacer, about three of them to keep that off the surface. So the wax melts through, the big impurities are left on top of that screen. But you've got an old refrigerator drawer that's at the very bottom of it for that to run down into it. it it's pretty nice fairly pure wax that comes to it. This is, this is double pane. Got this plan for a buck from a Brushy Mountain Beekeeper keeping the supply out of Carolinas. I recommend them. I like, my friend Dan likes uh, Man Lake out of Minnesota. Uh, Valhalla will have supplies that you can get at the store. And pay Nebraska sales tax. Not so you, know, you want to do that? That's fine. Um, but yeah. and the, the original plan has this done in one by lumber, but you get so much more R value with that next inch of lumber, next three quarter, that I made it out of two lines. Holds the heat in there. Paint the interior white to reflect the heat around. 
paint the outside black to collect heat. But it gets, it gets hot as a pistol out here. 150 degrees, 160 degrees even. even. Melting point of wax is 145, so you know it's above that. But if you would happen to get used equipment somewhere, which I don't recommend, but you want to clean it up, I see nothing wrong with taking these boards out here. And I think I'm going to periodically sort of cut down any infective thing that's in my eyes by taking out these boards, setting that in there, taking it up to 160 or so. You know, pasteurization temperature is only 1.5 for an extended period of time. So I think it'd be a good disease control thing, especially for the small backyard person. They spend maybe two to three weeks in all those other jobs combined, and then the, they go to foraging, bringing them in from a distance, and that's the thing that really puts the miles on their speedometer and shortens their life, because they're working hard. A summer bee's lifespan is only 35 days from eclosion. You know, plus, you know, don't count her eggs or larvae or pupil day. The winter time, that bee needs to get through the winter, and she's not flying, but she's using those muscles to generate heat, but she will live from October to oh, March. Because Homeland Security, they know their days are maybe short. They're the ones looking for the wrong thing at the wrong place, and they are ready to give their life, because there's not many days left anyway, it seems system, uh, a functioning defense system in life preceded a central nervous system brain by a billion years. So we need a, a little bit of defense just to keep us going. How does, from toxicology class, how does tobacco work? Your nerves fire and it gives gives the messages to the rest of the body, it takes it to the central nervous system and goes back up by the nerves firing. And then at that junction between an axon on one and the body on another, there's a little bit of enzyme that uh, deactivates that acetylcholine, it's called acetylcholinesterase. Nicotine wipes out that acetylcholinesterase, so the nerve keeps firing exhausting the system and, and that's a fight or flight response. You know, we've got our willing brain that tells our muscles to do this and that, but you've got an automatic pilot that runs your respiration, runs your heart, uh, runs the thermal regulatory thing, takes care of digestion. We don't have to voluntarily say, okay, long breathe for me, okay, get, digest for me. Uh, those systems do it. You can modify them some, like a Hindu yoga can slow his heart rate down to a dime, 10 or 11. But that, that takes some, some education and some discipline. But our bees, are anybody, smokers, that's why smokers smoke, because they're just at a little higher level of energy, should we say. It's a stimulant. You can be stimulated to death, and that's what's happening to our bees. And, and when all that energy is marshaled to the fight or flight response, we call it, and the, you have to decide which bit is better to do the fight, stand and fight or, or fly, but it, it marshals energy to your muscles to get out of there. You know, you've heard all those stories about people with superhuman strength lifting the car off of somebody after an accident. <coughs> But your body can't do that for long. And that's why our, our bees are losing their orientation, they're losing their longevity, they're losing their ability to fight off infections. And we're next. 